Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. It's been a while since we've had a podcast here, and that's primarily the result of the fact that I did not really have any subjects that I wanted to address in a podcast. I've been putting out ideas mostly in article form on my website, which you can find there. But it uh, occurred to me that uh, we should make a podcast here. It's been a while, so let's try to let's try to do that. And the subject of this podcast is a subject that we've talked about in one way or another in previous podcasts, and that is the willingness to do what is necessary to accomplish the goal. The willingness to do what is necessary to get the job done. Doing that which is necessary and that which is required. And one of the ancillary subjects of this podcast is also going to be the willingness of those in power to delude themselves or the willingness of those who hold power to find excuses for why they should not do what they need to do and their preference for being entertained by empty phrases, empty words, and meaningless vanities. And this is a very common thing with power, and with people in general, for that matter. And it's something that we should all reflect upon here. And I think there's no better way to do this than to talk about Sun Tzu's The Art of War, which came into my mind uh, last week as we were playing around on Twitter. And it just occurred to me that one of the best illustrations of this principle of the willingness to do what is necessary comes in the the prologue to Sun Tzu's Art of War. So I want to read a very short passage here, which I'm going to take from Samuel B. Griffith's uh, wonderful translation of Sun Tzu, which I've had for many decades. It was issued to me first in the basic school back in 1990 in the Marine Corps, and I've uh, held on to it ever since. And I think once I finish reading this, you'll understand why I think it's so important to reflect on. So let's let's do this here. The section here is entitled Biography of Sun Tzu. So let me go ahead and read this. Doing my best, obviously, to pronounce these Chinese names. And I make no claim to have any knowledge of the Chinese language, um, purely dependent on the... Um, anglicizations here in the text, so just bear with me, those of you who do know Chinese. And it says here, Sun Tzu was a native of Qi, who by means of his book on the art of war secured an audience with Ho Lu, king of Wu. Ho Lu said, I have read your thirteen chapters, sir, in their entirety. Can you conduct a minor experiment in control of the movement of troops? Sun Tzu replied, I can. Holus asked, Can you conduct this test using women? Sun Tzu said, Yes. The king thereupon agreed and sent from the palace 180 beautiful women. Sun Tzu divided them into two companies and put the king's two favorite concubines in command. He instructed them all how to hold halberds. He then said, Do you know where the heart is, and where the right and left hands and the back are? The women said, We know. Sun Tzu said, When I give the order front, face in the direction of the heart. When I say left, face towards the left hand. When I say right, towards the right. And when I say rear, face in the direction of your backs. The women said, We understand. When these regulations had been announced, the executioner's weapons were arranged. Sun Tzu then gave the orders three times and explained them, four t- explained them five times, after which he beat on the drum the signal, Face right. The women all roared with laughter. Sun Tzu said, If regulations are not clear and orders not thoroughly explained, 
It is the commander's fault. He then repeated the orders three times and explained them five times and gave the drum signal to face to the left. The women again burst into laughter. Sun Tzu said, If instructions are not clear and commands not explicit, it is the commander's fault. But when they have been made clear and are not carried out in accordance with military law, it is a crime on the part of the officers. Then he ordered that the commanders of the right and the left ranks be beheaded. The king of Wu, who was reviewing the proceedings from his terrace, saw that his two beloved concub- concubines were about to be executed. He was terrified and hurriedly sent an aide with this message. I already know that the general is able to employ troops. Without these two concubines, my food will not taste sweet. It is my desire that they be not executed. Sun Tzu replied, Your servant has already received your appointment as commander, and when the commander is at the head of the army, he need not accept all the sovereign's orders. Consequently, he ordered that the two women who had commanded the ranks be executed as an example. He then used the next seniors as company commanders. Thereupon he repeated the signals on the drum, and the women faced left, right, to the front, to the rear, knelt and rose, all in strict accordance with the prescribed drill. They did not dare to make the slightest noise. Sun Tzu then sent a messenger to the king and informed them, informed him. The troops are now in good order. The king may descend to review and inspect them. They may be employed as the king desires, even to the extent of going through fire and water. The king of Wu said, The general may go to his hostel and rest. I do not wish to come to inspect them. Sun Tzu said, The king likes only empty words. He is not capable of putting them into practice. Ho Lu then realized Sun Tzu's capacity as a commander and eventually made him a general. All right. Let's discuss this passage here. First of all, you know what a halberd is. It's an ancient weapon, which was a combination of a spear and battle axe. But consider this very, very compelling introduction. What a fantastic anecdote. What a brilliant anecdote that is. Now, whether this actually happened or not is unclear. It's certainly possible, but seems to strain the credulity to think that a general would dare to have the king's two favorite concubines executed. Although we don't know. We can never really know for sure. Perhaps something like it did happen. Perhaps not. In any case, it's irrelevant. The point is, the point is that the author of that anecdote is making a point, and that is that number one, Sun Tzu was a man of ferocious discipline, a man who understood the necessity of getting the job done, a man who was not afraid to do that that which was necessary to get the job done. And sometimes when you are in a situation where you have to do something, you can't prevaricate, you can't hesitate, you can't waste time. You have to do what is necessary to get the job done. And I think that's important to understand. Now, obviously, not all of us are going to be faced with situations like this, with reviewing troops or with with, uh, uh, going into battle or things like that. But all of us in our lives, every one of us, has to face severe challenges, severe tests, severe trials, severe challenges, that which confounds the soul, things that confound the soul and challenge the intellect. And when those moments come along, we have to be willing to do that which is necessary to get the job done. Because it's often misunderstood that people don't know what they need to do. They don't 
really understand what they need to do. I've never believed that. They know, people know what they need to do. The problem with life is not so much knowing what to do. The problem that people encounter is a failure of will in carrying out the necessary actions needed to solve the problem. This is where people stumble or fall or hesitate. They are unwilling to do that which is necessary to deal with the situation. And that really is the lesson of this little prologue from the art of war. And as I said in the beginning, an ancillary lesson of this anecdote is that there are many people who like to be deluded by sweet words. They want to hear what they need to do, but they're not really truly committed to actually carrying out what needs to be done, just like the king in this example. He said, no, I don't need to inspect the troops. He told uh, Sun Tzu, I don't need to inspect the troops. That's okay. That's all right. And Sun Tzu saw right through it that, that what he was dealing with, what he was dealing with was someone who was squeamish and did not really understand the level of discipline it takes to solve a problem. It takes a very high level of focus, dedication, and ruthless discipline to really solve problems in life. And you will find as you go through life that there are two different types of people. There are those who are willing to do what is necessary to get the job done. And then there are those who are not willing to do what is necessary to get the job done. Those who would prefer to be appeased by sweet words, honeyed words, but don't really want to take action. And isn't this the truth? How many people do we know that fit this description in our lives? They want to hear what they need to do, but they don't really want to do what they need to do. And this is something that needs to be kept in mind. It really needs to be kept in mind. So that's something I think we should think about. And you know, along those lines, I've been watching in the past few days, the past week actually, this uh, uh, Ken Burns special on the Vietnam War which is a great series. If you get a chance to see it, you, you really should see it. I mean, we've, we've all read, I mean, I've read a lot of books about the Vietnam War, and I've seen documentaries about it, but it's always good to see the historical events there interpreted, you know, every with every generation, every uh, new perspective that's placed on it. But again, what shines through in this documentary about the Vietnam War is that the reason why the North Vietnamese, North Vietnamese succeeded and the United States did not was because they were prepared and willing to do that which was necessary to win. They were simply prepared to absorb more punishment, to exert greater efforts, to put in more lives, more men, more skin in the game, frankly, for lack of a better phrase, than the United States was. And when you're faced with that kind of situation, you, you just can't win. You, you, you just can't win, no matter how much you try to sugarcoat it. And you can apply this lesson ab about the willingness to do what's necessary to almost any scenario. And I think we see it also in modern American politics, the current situation that the country is in now where we're facing severe problems, severe structural problems on all levels, economic, social, political, educational, health, infrastructure. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And there are problems that are deeply symptomatic that have not been addressed by any of the leaders that we've had in the past, what, 30, 40 years and they just continue to get worse and worse and worse. Because no one is really willing to do what is necessary of either party. Either party. Both of them are guilty of the same level of moral cowardice. The lack of moral integrity. To do what is necessary. To fix problems that need to be fixed. They're unwilling to do what is necessary to fix the problems that need to be fixed. They're unwilling to change the laws. They're unwilling to take on 
the vast concentrations of wealth and power that exist at the very top that are deeply destabilizing to the republic. They're unwilling to reform laws that need to be reformed, to rebuild the infrastructure, to provide for the education, the health, welfare of its citizens. They're unwilling to do this. Unwilling to do this. No matter what they say, no matter what pirouetting around the throne that they do, the answer is clear. They're unwilling to put themselves out, to put their asses on the line, to do what is necessary to solve problems. And so problems fester, and they're solved one way or the other. And if problems are not solved one way, they're solved another way. And this is the, this is the big challenge. This is the big challenge that we have. And it's not clear yet how these issues are going to be dealt with. And I'll leave you with um, my last comment along these lines. I was reading in a forgotten book of history, Leonardo Bruni's History of the Florentine People, which was written in the Middle Ages, written in um, in the you know the 1440s. And there's a great line in this history where he's talking about a incompetent and inept ruler who took power in Florence who was called Walter, the Duke of Athens. I'm not going to bore you with a description of who he was or what he did, but he was one of these fakes, these phonies, these frauds, who was elevated to a position of leadership. But as Bruni is describing this guy's rise and fall, he has a very good sentence in here. He says, and the sentence uh, the sentence is in Latin, so I, I, I'm just going to read my own translation of it, but basically what he says, he says, uh, it will become obvious that citizens should dread nothing more than servitude and the elites will learn that nothing is more disastrous than immoderate and uncivil arrogance. And this is, uh, this quote is found in book six uh, section 117, book 6, section 117, if anyone's interested, if anyone has the book, which I doubt, but I'll give it anyway. And so, again, uh, he's, he's basically saying for, for citizens, uh, citizens of a, of, a, uh, of a civil state should be fearful of nothing more than, than subservience, than, than servitude, being reduced to a level of servitude. And the elites, in those days it was called lords, uh, should, should be aware that nothing is more disastrous to the health of a civil uh, polity than uncivil arrogance, than arrogance and greed. And it was true in 1440, it was true in 1940, and it's true now. Nothing has changed. So the lesson here is, as we get back to Sun Tzu, and again, I'm using that lesson not really in a military context, but in a social context. If leaders are not willing to do what is necessary to solve problems, then they create more problems. They postpone. and They postpone problems and they create, they increase divisions, they increase divisiveness, and they essentially um, uh, are disastrous as rulers. And so these are the things that we need to be thinking about. So again, it's a very broad lesson. It's, a, it's something that you can apply to any area or aspect of your life. But just think about that. When you're, when you're, look, you and I cannot control the outcome of world events. You and I are just people. We're just citizens. We have no control over what happens or what goes on or who does what or who says this or who says that. All we can really do is focus on ourselves and on the sphere of influence that we can exert influence over. 
which is very, very limited. And I think you can apply this lesson of doing what is necessary to any aspect of your life. So just think about that. But also, we also have an obligation to be aware of what's going on. And we have an obligation to know that history does have a way of repeating certain patterns. And we have to be aware of that so we can understand what's going on around us. So we can pierce through the propaganda, the nonsense, the distractions, the obfuscations that we see all around us. So think about that. Think about that. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.